All right, we're going to talk about Move It Servo today, which is uh, the real-time component of Move It so far. And it's good for real-time robot jogging. And an example of that is visual servoing like this. So the guy is moving uh, some kind of image to be tracked, and the robot's tracking it in real time. So, I mean, mostly what real-time means on this slide is calculations are done very fast, you know, faster than one kilohertz and faster than most robots need these days. And we'll talk a little bit more about like what real time means on a te technical level. But um, some reasons why you might want to use this are visual servoing, teleoperation. So, you know, that would be several of the projects we have going on right now, especially the medical type stuff. And then contact tasks. So the robot can't predict when it's going to make contact of anything. It needs to be able to react in real time. And servo is good for all of those things. So how fast is fast enough? Well, um, there's still a lot of industrial robots out there that operate at 60 hertz. Some of the newer uh, robots are operating at 250 hertz. And then the humanoids are operating really, really fast, you know, control rates upwards of one kilohertz. So we want to be able to hit at least a kilohertz, I would say. So basically how to serve a work, um, it's kind of a, it's, it's called differential kinematics. Um, so this Jacobian is a matrix. You feed in like a vector of change in Cartesian pose that you want to achieve. Maybe that comes from like a joystick if you're doing teleoperation, or maybe it comes from an image if you're doing visual servoing. You multiply with this matrix, and then you get a change in joint angles out. So you add that change in joint angles to the robot's current joints, and that gives you uh, the output target for the robot. And what this matrix is basically is a bunch of partial derivatives, and we just get it from move it. So here's kind of an example. If you're you've never heard of the Jacobian before, and you want to uh, like I don't know derive it for yourself or something, I'm not really going to go through it. But this is just for a two off robot. So you have two links, theta one and theta two, and you've got the link lengths. And what you want to calculate for the Jacobian is given a change in theta one, how, how is X going to change? And then given a change in, you know, theta one, how is Y going to change? And the same thing for theta two. Um, so since it's, you know, in this example, we only care about X and Y, that's two dimensions. We have two joints. It ends up being a two by two matrix. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Uh, there's kind of a, like for a six-off robot, it gets a lot more complicated, but there's a formula that move it just applies to do it automatically. So that's awesome. Uh, this is kind of a block diagram of how servo works. It's basically what I just described, right? You just feed in your requested change in Cartesian pose. You get that Jacobian from servo or from move it, and you invert it, and then you multiply um, to get the change in joint values. It's a little bit tricky because we also need to run collision checking, and that's pretty slow. It takes about maybe like 0.1 to 5 milliseconds per iteration. That's not fast enough. So what we did is we put that in a separate thread and uh, kind of combine it with some logic of the output here from the... Oh, that shouldn't say admit and such, say servo. Oops. Anyways, we combine it with the output, and uh, that decelerates based on like how fast you are or how close you are to a collision. All right, so let's talk about a little bit better definition of what real time means. So I guess I'm going to go through this, and I'm going to ask Tyler if he has any input, because he gave a previous tech talk on it. But basically, it means the calculation will be ready when you expect it to be ready. So you can have hard real time, which means guaranteed timeliness. Regardless of your operating conditions, the new joint angles are going to be ready. But we aren't there yet. We're still at soft real time, which means it gives a best effort to achieve timeliness, but it's not guaranteed. Um, and if it does fail, the, the deadline is not catastrophic. So will Servo ever be hard real time? Probably not. It probably doesn't need to be. Um, some reasons why it's not. Well, for one thing, we usually run it on a non-real time kernel. So, I mean, no matter how good the code is, it can't be. Um, some other things that could screw that up, like if we had a very large number of joints, or if you tried to run servo while you're building move it and uh, you have no like CPU overhead left, um, you'll obviously miss your loop rate due to that. 
Some other stuff is some dynamic memory allocation. I have a slide to talk about that coming up, but if you try to like instantiate a standard string in a loop or change vector size in a loop, um, that stuff can uh, really slow down runtime and it's not predictable how long it will take. And then probably the last reason why servo will never be hard real time is we're using a mutex to synchronize those two threads. Uh, but overall, all in all, I will say um, it seems to be good enough for our purposes. Uh, do you want to say anything about that, Tyler? Oh, I, this is a really good summary of, yeah, I don't I, have anything else to add. I have a question. Um, if you didn't care about collisions, could it, would it be, would that be like 90% of the way to hard real time? Yeah, I guess it would be. Yep. You, uh, I think the only problem there is uh, the stuff still in ROS. So we're still publishing and subscribing through ROS and at least the ROS one publisher and subscriber uh, it does dynamic memory allocation, and so that's that would would be limited by that. So, but other other than that, I, I don't think any of the code. Yeah, if we were able to, if we ran without collision checking, it would be it'd be faster. And. Well, we just um, get rid of the index, right? Right. Another question about the, so that you mentioned the Jacobians calculated, is that calculated on the fly each time? Is yeah. there like a relinearization at each? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So that's kind of why I say a large number of joints might make this non real time. And then you have to invert it too, so that right. gets expensive. Yep. Are you going to say anything about the, uh, the null space of the Jacobian, if you can maybe use that to optimize secondary objectives. Yeah, yep, we'll get to that. Okay. So I have one last comment on this. Uh, I think it's also a really great summary. Um, one thing to note here is on the ROS2 control side, though, I believe that's all been designed uh, to be real time, and that handles all the, the lower level, like um, the actual loop rates and stuff like that, right, Andy? Um. Let's see. We still need if to you're running on a kernel. ROS2 control. Yeah, but they were really careful about making their code real time. So once yeah. you get the message to them, yeah, then you should be real time. So they don't have any of the dynamic memory allocation or the mutexes. Uh, right. Because it's not as, you know, not as tricky functionality. Right. Yep. Andy, I have a thought. Um, we we got to watch Verb Surgical convert their code base from like soft real time to hard real time. And it's definitely a known set of changes to the code, like removing strings and such. So you said probably not will ever be hard real time, but we could, right? If we just had the funding and the in interest? Well, if we make collision checking faster, and I think there's a path to do that, uh, you know, maybe we could hit a kilohertz reliably without, uh, yeah. But the, 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 the Collision checking is behind a non-blocking mutex, right? So it's not yeah, a... Yeah, collision checking is not true. happening in the same thread. So the thing gen generating the outputs could be made hard real time. Um, that probably only in Rust 2, but yeah, could be. Um, if we wanted to... If we wanted the whole thing to be hard real time, we would need a collision checker that didn't allocate memory. Uh, that might be a really big ask. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, we made a PR recently um, motivated by AL that made collision checking a lot faster. So this is like a good tie in, I guess, but just by um, <laughs> going th through and identifying some variables that are allocated in a loop, uh, you know, we sped runtime up by like 50%. And the way we did that is we made some variables thread local. So basically what that means is um, each thread that's running this loop has its own copy of that variable. It doesn't recreate it every time in the loop. And I think somebody should do this in the rest of the FCL code. It's like pretty easy and it can really, really help runtime. Uh, there was some other stuff involved with that too in getting the runtime down, but. So it is tricky. Um, some of the maintainers left some comments like this, like, 
all in all, stack variables are very cheap and should nearly always be cheap, cheaper than accessing the heap or static variables, since the stack should always be in the cache. Allocating on the stack is also very cheap. It's just incrementing the stack pointer. So in my mind, there should be little reason to turn primitive types such as bool or int into thread local variables. But who knows? Computers are complicated beasts. For types of costly c constructors, there may be some argument, but I don't see those here. The standard pair gets completely overwritten on every call anyway, so there shouldn't be any benefit. So like kind of what I got out of that is thread local is worthless on double or enum or you know variables that are very simple and have a fixed size. But if you have some of these uh, longer variables that have a, you know, I don't know, non-trivial constructor, it might be worth uh, using thread local there. Does anybody want to comment on that? It's a good reason to have integration and unit tests because then it's uh, not very expensive to go and quantify the speed up. Yeah, Andy did a bunch of really nice profiling on this that showed where where the benefits were. It is labor intensive though, but okay. So kind of back to some features about Servo. Uh, we already said it's computationally fast. One of the nice things about this Jacobian approach is it follows a predictable straight line. So, you know, if you're trying to do surgery, you don't scare somebody with a crazy motion plan. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm trying to do surgery, I'm going to scare somebody. <laughs> Well, my brother does. It minimizes tracking here locally, and it minimizes joint velocities locally. So kind of like a side effect of that is it's optimally good at avoiding singularities locally, and it works for any number of DOF. So how that works is like if you have a 5 DOF arm and you're trying to track a 6 DOF pose, it minimizes the pose error. It's not going to be able to achieve that 6 DOF pose because it doesn't have enough joints, but it will get as close as possible given the 5 joints. So that's like kind of a nice property of it. Um, and it also works if you have more than 6 joints. So let's just kind of talk about what a singularity is here. I don't know. Uh, maybe there's a couple people who don't know, but I found this GIF. So basically what you're going to see is all the axes, almost all the axes are parallel. And when they're parallel, it can't, the robot can't move out of the plane without, um, while maintaining its end effector orientation. Uh, so that would be a singularity. It's just impossible to move that way. I'll just let this. Isn't a singularity uh, an artifact of the map being used? The, the the robot hardware could move out of it while keeping the end effector, but it's just the map. Doesn't I th I th it's impossible, actually, in this case. I mean, like, you could, if I could pause the GIF, we could try to think about how the robot would move, but there's no way. There's only one joint that brings it out of the plane, and that would change the uh, rotation of the end effector. Yeah, I, I guess when I think about this GIF, you're, you're right, but, hmm, okay. Another really good example is if you put one of the joints, like, if you put the, the first wrist joint in line with the, the base joint, parallel with it. So if those two joints were, were parallel, um, you basically have a five degree freedom robot operating in six degree freedom space. So you, you lose a dimension that you can move in. Yep. Dave, I think you might be thinking about uh, gimbal lock and using quaternions versus Euler angles. Yeah, I'm gonna probably think about that. Thanks. Oops. But there are also advantages to singularities, right? That sometimes you get a mechanical advantage if you're trying to sort of think about standing straight up like you lock out your knees and you stand straight so that you don't have to you know apply use that much energy um so you also we can generate black holes so that we can you know create time <laughs> yeah, travel the, the payload on many of the arms is determined by you know uh like being at the weakest position right you said okay, the payload is five kilogram but really the robot can do a lot more if you are taking advantage of certain you know singularities right or if you Somehow, uh, yeah, there's a lot of the mechanics that you could exploit that currently nobody does that. Um, can you guys see the YouTube video? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I guess this covers all the types of singularities. It's a pretty cool video. So they're trying to move here, and they just can't. So you kind of get a divide by zero error, and the wrist is going crazy. Uh, that's really what it comes down to is divide by zero. 
So this moves through singularity and the wrist rotates very quickly. <laughs> So it's the kind of thing that's always fun to see for a full-size industrial robot. <laughs> also, Andy, I think it might be worth mentioning that these are actually like real videos, not simulations, which I thought was oh, yeah. pretty awesome from this guy. His, uh, the thing he has attached to his end effector is amazing. Love it. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be nice to have something like that pretty often. Um, so yeah, limitations. I said it is good at avoiding singularities, but if you really try to drive it into singularity, you can get crazy behavior like that. So basically what happens right now is it just has a threshold and it stops before it hits singularity. Same thing with joint limits. It doesn't know how to avoid joint limits, so it stops before it hits them. And the same thing with collisions. Uh, so I'll, if Adam's here, could you talk about this? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the I didn't work on this. Andy did this, and Tyler. Um, but one of the one of the things I like it, with Servo is is a new feature is pose tracking, which is basically to use everything. I literally took the the picture from the slide and just added like the PID controller to the input. So instead of like a joystick or or a human telling the robot what to do, um, yeah, it's a control loop. And what that lets you do is instead of defining a change from your current spot as your command, you can send an absolute Cartesian pose to the end effector. Um, I mean, you know, it should probably be close to the current thing. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get stuck in a local minima from the joint limits or the or singularity. Um, but that's great for, or if you go to the next slide, um, you know, going to specific poses. And this is on. My robot at my lab, I did this in hardware using, this is using post tracking. So the, the, the camera on the left arm is staying pointed at the gripper as it's moving around. And one of the interesting things with Servo is that there's this drift dimension, which is basically um, eliminating an output direction that you care about. So here, we, we don't control for the position, just for the orientation, which makes this manipulator redundant because um, it's only operating in a three degree freedom output space. So it, we don't have to worry as much about singularities while we're uh, uh, you know, post tracking. And then the, the, other, the other tweet is similar. It's just, um, uh, I like it better. So yeah, it should, it's, it's while the robot is moving and it's using, it's like getting the pose from, uh, uh, G mapping to to stare at the valve. So that's like me driving the robot and the the camera automatically tracking the the, the wheel there. This is not actually visual servoing though because it's not using the camera feed to determine how to move. So I have a question about the math behind the Jacobian servo that. Um, um, the one where you can say I don't care about this DOF on the pose I'm tracking, is that a binary thing? Or could you say I care about this, but only half as much as I care about this dimension? Um, as it is now, it's binary on or off. And what it's actually doing is it's taking that Jacobian and removing rows from it. I'm pretty sure you could do what Nathan's talking about. I don't know how off the top of my head, though. But there's, yeah, there's uh, implementation limitation, but it's not a mathematic, mathematically uh, an impossibility. Yep. Okay. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> I have a question about the drift stuff. So when you remove those rows and you solve that, um, whatever the box was, that was the the um, servo calculation. Um, do you get a single solution, or do you get a space of solutions that you then pick one out of? Yeah. So um, that. Mark mentioned that a little bit about the null space. This is like introducing the null space, of, of course. Um, that inverse uh, gets a single solution, which minimizes the joint velocities. OK. Um, but I mean, in theory, it would be possible to like do that differently to, to do stuff with the null space, like, okay. to, fit a, to fit another objective function, OK. which would be interesting. Yeah, oh yeah. So the other thing I was going to talk about is um, 
uh, porting Servo to Move It To, which uh, I did as a Google Summer of Code project last summer. Um, and it's stable and it works, I guess. Um, <laughs> and part, part of the part of the <laughs> part of the, um, the the tr tr transition from ROS one to ROS two was just figuring out like how to how to launch it because in ROS one it's easy, it just it's its own thing. It's a service. I mean, it, it listens to topics and it outputs topics. Um, in ROS two, you can do you can include it in a, in, a, in your own node. And use a C++ interface, um, and then we kind of copied the the uh, standalone server uh, component to as a composable node. And then yeah, I I also wrote a bunch of tests for it, but a lot of those were launch tests which aren't working, and it's sad. But that might not be our fault. Maybe question mark. I mean, we yeah, we think something. It's it's not the test itself. It's the Python code that observes the output of the test that has gone flaky, and we haven't figured out how to fix that. Uh, we think something changed in launch test, which is the thing in ROS that is that Python code that observes the output of tests. So somehow, um, even though the test reliably passes and is a good test. Uh, the ROS code that's supposed to, like, l literally just observe standard error and standard out fails. Um, like, that's all it's supposed to do. And somehow that's, <laughs> that's yeah, we haven't figured out why. And it seems to be a common problem across a lot of ROS2 projects that nobody really knows why yet. And it's sad. And, yeah, <laughs> nobody's fixed it. Yeah. All right. So future work, kind of some stuff Mark was pointing towards. Uh, one way you can use the null space, which is kind of like, you know, if you're overactuated, so you have a seven degree of freedom robot, your task only requires six uh, degrees, you have an extra degree of freedom to play with. And in that case, you can start prioritizing other tasks. So maybe you use that to avoid a joint limit. And the way stack of tasks works is there's like a, a hierarchy of, you know, First, you want to minimize tracking error. Then you want to minimize uh, distance from joint angles. Then you want to minimize distance to collision or something like that, or maximize, I guess. And then uh, Mark posted something in Slack about Peter Cork's new method, which I need to look into yet. I haven't been able to absorb, really. Uh, do you want to mention anything about that, Mark? Or do you know how it's different? I don't know. Mark it. It. Oh, OK. Uh, it looked really basic. That's, I guess, the uh, when I looked at that paper, I was like, oh, okay, it looks kind of interesting. And I had a URL. And when you look at the URL, it's like I was trying to find the method in the code. And it took me a while to realize that like, the whole code that's on that one page is the algorithm. There's nothing more to it. It's, you know, this, yeah, it calls some other things that are maybe possibly tricky to implement. But I think a lot of the building blocks are there to do something very similar in, in Move It Servo. So I was like, oh. Potentially, this is low hanging fruit, but I don't know enough about Move It Servo to sort of figure out if it's that easy. Uh, but yeah, it's worth a look, I think. I mean, it sounds good to me. I'm just worried there's usually a trade off. Like, if you start yeah. prioritizing something else, you lose something. But yeah. Uh, so, so I guess my, my bias is that, you know, Peter Cork is no dummy. <laughs> He's been, yeah. uh, he has had his robotics toolbox for a long time. Computer vision guru has written textbooks about it. If he's willing to put his uh, his name on it, it's probably not terrible. <laughs> so maybe that's maybe that's a, a bad bias to have, and maybe that's uh, that's I would take it. Yeah, I mean, we should always try to understand things, right, before we just blindly implement them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so another thing we could do is uh, replace the Jacobian and provide a BioIK alternative. So that has the really nice benefit of being extremely flexible. Like you can allow almost any goal. Um, the maybe downside a little bit is it's non-deterministic, so the output's a little bit noisy, and it's probably harder to use. Uh, I mean, it takes some time to understand how to define the goals and stuff like that. Uh, now, maybe, Adam, you can talk about damped least squares. Yeah, yeah so I think you should actually go to the next slide. Okay. Um, one of the things I started to do and, and didn't was look at damped least squares, 
um, especially around a singularity. Um, there's a little bit of a problem here because as as you add more damping here, you lose your tracking. So the 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 the, the robot does not move exactly how it's supposed to, um, but it doesn't go through singularity. So there's like a trade-off there that I was really struggling with, like how that's like a decision that somebody has to make um, is how to balance those two things. So basically what you do is um, in a singularity, the Jacobian becomes unstable to invert, uh, and then the joint velocities go to infinity, which is not good. Um, so what you do is you literally just change it a little bit by adding, you change what you're inverting a little bit by adding a damping factor to the diagonal, basically, um, so that you <laughs> you can invert it and you get something that's close to your original motion that you're trying to get. Have you looked at selectively damped least squares? It's I new. did look at it a little bit. Um, basically, it's my understanding of it is that instead of adding, so it instead of adding the same thing to the whole diagonal, it adds different weights to different. Um, yeah, it, it, different it's, a, it's a simple change, and it's easy to experiment like which version works better. But it's, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I looked at so I looked at this a little bit. I just I was really struggling with the 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 trade off, and like after you go through a, a portion of of Danfoy squares, do you like try to go? Use pose tracking or something to like go back to, to make up the difference that you missed or, or, or things like that. So, yeah. is that I mean is that something though where like you just add this small damping factor and it makes a big difference when you're right near a singularity, but otherwise it's just a little bit of noise in your solution. Um, yeah, a little bit. And yeah. what I was actually doing was using the threshold that we would stop at, and instead of stopping, switching to this instead of oh, okay. one version. So, so the damping is in, is basically zero while you're, uh, while you're not near us. While you're not, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's all I had. So.